Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, look, my, my role here today is to sort of give a little uh, historical overview, a little perspective, uh, a little psychology, uh, and hopefully a sort of a bit of a, a three-dimensional matrix to uh, the PDFF. Uh, and then uh, David and Brian will go into it in a great deal more detail. And then, as Jeff has said, uh, after the, uh, the break for morning tea, uh, we'll all be available here to engage with uh, everybody in the room uh, with regard to uh, ideas that come out of this uh, event today. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know that we are having a parallel version of this event in Melbourne tomorrow. Uh, so we're equally engaging with the uh, uh, members and, and, and other colleagues in, uh, in Victoria and then of course via the uh, web uh, magic of uh, Encore, uh, what we do here today and it will be available to uh, members and colleagues in the, in the other states. So let me begin. Uh, for 40 years, Australian governments, both Liberal and Labor, have supported the Australian film production industry using a portfolio of subsidy mechanisms that have swung between direct and indirect intervention. Over a billion dollars of taxpayers' funds have been deployed to our business. During that period, the industry has created a growing number of world-class directors, actors, technicians, and visual effects personnel, many of whom have relocated to Los Angeles following their initial successes. Over that same four decades, Australian governments have similarly supported the Australian television production industry. When one analyses the respective successes of film and television, we are perplexed to find a vibrant television drama production business continually producing content that regularly connects with Australian audiences, rating north of a million viewers and often north of two million viewers for event-free television. On the other hand, the Australian feature film industry, with the occasional exceptional year, struggles to achieve 5% of the Australian domestic theatrical box office and frequently achieves much less. There is a strong tabloid media driven impression that the Australian feature film industry has a brand problem with consumers and whether that is correct or not, Australian movie audiences really go to see Australian films in cinemas. Now that was not always the case. In the pre-war thirties, Cinesound under Kenji Hall had an unprecedented run of success at the Australian box office with local dramas and comedies aimed at the domestic audience. Films like On Our Selection and Dad and Dave filmed, Australia, uh, filmed Australian cinemas in the city, the suburbs and the country. In the seventies, as the new Australian cinema got underway, films produced by Hexagon like Alvin Purple and Eliza Fraser, and films supported by Greater Union, like Picking and Hanging Rock or Caddy, did outstanding domestic business. In 2009, Tate Brady coordinated a research project that updated 1970s box office numbers to 2009 dollars. Alvin Purple's $4.7 million in 1973 equaled $36.7 million 2009 dollars and Picnic's 5.1 million in 1975 equaled $30 million. Tate's chart cited multiple similar examples from the 70s and the early 80s, including Gallipoli, Breaking Marant, and The Man from Snowy River, to mention just a few. A review of those numbers obviously provokes the question, what industrial circumstances prompted the success of these films? Uh, I think the answer is obvious. All of these 70s films and the 30s Cinesound films had a distributor as a partner or collaborator from their inception. In the same way that no fiction television drama airs on Australian television without a broadcaster involved from the early development stage, thus ensuring a marketplace driven evaluation with approval or rejection of the content proposed, these marketplace successful films that I mentioned developed along similar lines. When the producer offset was introduced in 2007, it was intended to herald a significant shift in the way the Australian feature film industry was funded. 
and in the words of Senator Kent when he introduced the legislation to help create sustainable businesses and to reduce the recurrent need for continued subsidy and to encourage more market-friendly productions. The producer offset was embraced by the industry and has been successful at the lower end and the higher end of Australian budget ranges. In the $1 million to $5 million range, productions utilising the offset and with co-investment from Screen Australia have resulted in occasional marketplace successes but equally importantly have introduced talented new filmmaking personnel into the industry ecosphere. Recent theatrical box office releases like Wasted on the Young, Grifty Invisible uh, or uh, Red Hill, to cite three examples, have turbocharged the careers of their directors and put them on the international radar. And at the top end of the budget range, titles ranging from Knowing to Sanctum, from Australia to Tomorrow when the War Began, have performed notably at the Australian box office and given Australian audiences the value for dollar entertainment experience they expect when they go to the movies. But there is a black spot where the offset is not working, and that black spot is the seven to thirty million dollar budget range. These mid-range productions encompass the scope and scale that enable our filmmakers to deliver a full theatrical cinematic experience. But given the offset was introduced at the onset of the GFC, when pre-sales vanished, banks pulled out of the sector, especially US distribution companies shut down, and funding for Screen Australia was progressively being reduced, the capacity to work in this vital budget range, utilising the offset, has proved virtually impossible. Why vital? Why do I say it's vital? Firstly, because this is the budget range into which Australian producers, directors and talent should be able to move once they have demonstrated their skills in the lower budget arena. In the current environment, the talent we develop in low budget is frequently forced to move to the United States to continue their career path. In other words, the Australian taxpayer is funding the R&D for US studios and financiers. Secondly, films that will perform in the multiplex as opposed to the specialty cinemas generally require a bigger scope and scale than can be achieved on low budget. If we are to increase our percentage of the domestic box office from 1 or 2 per cent to 10 per cent or more, the math is fairly simple. The domestic box office is a little over a billion dollars. 10 per cent is a hundred million dollars. So we need three or four Australias or five or six tomorrows or a blend. But we can't achieve it by only releasing one 30 to 35 million dollar grocer per year. Nor can we take the curse off Australian cinema in the minds of audiences who go to the cinema once a month. They need a frequent, regular and reaffirming dose of Australia cinema entertainment. Now, when Spire isn't alone in recognising this need, we're not the only geniuses in the room. Screen Australia too recognises this problem, this market failure. But Screen Australia's response is to ask government for an additional $60 million in funding over three years which it will likely deploy by the same evaluation processes that it has previously utilised and which it will utilise as equity, inevitably resulting in the same low rate of return as it has previously achieved. SPAR, on the other hand, has formulated the Producer Distributor Film Fund and that is why we are here today to, dis to explore the detail and the rationale. The PDFF is fundamentally a new paradigm. It is a market-triggered, non-evaluative top-up to the producer offset. To be more precise, it will be a one-off federal government initiative, a $60 million loan fund. Note, please, a loan fund, not equity. It will be funded to $20 million per year for three years. Secondly, it will be accessed by producers who bring distributor sales agent market co-commitment not by Screen Australia evaluation, thus assuring commercial rigour and expertise co-participate in the selection process. The typical financing plan will be one-third marketplace, one-third producer offset and one-third PDF loan, although as you will hear today, we are exploring various scenarios pursuant <coughs> to which the pieces of the Meccano set that independent producers often make use of for example, multi-territory distributed deals and or sales agent advances 
will in fact form the marketplace attachment. The PDFF, if we get it through, will have the following benefits. Firstly, it will allow Screen Australia to focus in the future on funding culturally relevant and new talent driven production without concern over market results. It will break the commercial cultural bifurcation which has bedeviled a proper analysis of our industry for 40 years. Secondly, it will provide an additional production funding door. Thirdly, it will enable Australian talent to continue to work in Australia as they move their careers to a larger scale. Uh, it will increase the percentage of Australian theatrical box office to total box office. It will create 900 plus new jobs in the film sector and it will provide a significantly better return to government as a priority recouping loan than a subordinated equity investment. Over the next hour, David Court and Brian Rosen will take us through the details of the PDF and how it would and could work in, pro in practice. As Jeff has indicated, the PDFF already has the support of the Liberal National Coalition and SPAR is prosecuting its adoption by the Labor government. Support for our industry, as we all know, has been traditionally non-partisan and we see no reason uh, for that non-partisan support by uh, both sides of the aisle to continue. 